Hey folks, this is the Yaku Cosmopolitan. Welcome back to This Week in Japanese Baseball, a show where I discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly that happened in the world of Japanese baseball over the past week. You can listen on YouTube, Patreon, and Spotify for free. I'm recording this on Thursday, April 18th.、Uh, I made a few appearances on other people's podcasts this week, by the way.、Uh, I was on the World Baseball Network's Baseball Without Borders show with、uh, Life. Uh, and then the baseball podcast with Ethan and Tom just talking about some MPB and、uh, Otani Ipe news. So、uh, check those out if you're interested. We are just about three weeks into the 2024 MPB season now. The standings are shaping up、uh, in a pretty interesting way thus far. Some surprises, some not so surprises. Ultimately, it's way too early to come to any conclusions, but. One good thing about MPB compared to MLB is that there's no tanking, you know, at least intentional tanking. So all the teams are fairly competitive early on. You're rarely going to see like a Marlins or White Sox type situation where the team is already 10 games out in the first month.、Um, so let's just quickly run through the standings here. In the Central League, the Chunichi Dragons are still hanging on to first place. They're 10 4 2. Then it's the Yomiuri Giants, a game and a half behind. The Hanshin Tigers are three and a half behind. They're starting to climb back. The Hiroshima Carp and the DNA Bay Stars are tied four games back. And then the Occult Swallows,、um, after a pretty good first couple of series, they have really started to fall off. So they are in last place, five games back. In the Pacific League, the SoftBank Hawks are still in first at 10, 5, 1.1. Then it's the Lotte Marines with a really strong week. They are here just one game back now. Then it's the Nippon Ham Fighters at 500, two and a half games back. The Oryx Buffaloes, much like their Kansai counterparts, they're fighting back after a slow start, so they're three back.、Uh, the Rakuten Eagles are four back. And then the Seibu Lions,、um, after a good start, have really struggled this past week. I think they're on a six game losing streak. The offense just isn't there, as you know, I, I worried for them before the season was going to be the case. So they are four and a half back、uh, in last place. Also, I talked about Yoshitomo Tsutsugo's return to Japan last week as my ugly point because, you know, he spent so many years grinding it out in the minors,、um, but it just ultimately didn't pay off with another shot in the majors. And at the time, there was a pretty convincing report that he was signing with the Yomiuri Giants, especially because his former team, the DNA Bay Stars, didn't really seem to have a spot for him on the roster. But just days after that, it was revealed that Tsutsugo was, in fact, going to sign with DNA.、Uh, so it's, you know, really good timing because Tyler Austin got hurt again last week. He's out for like a month. So Tsutsugo can probably fill in at first base in the coming weeks. Um, and they did reserve his jersey number 25 for him、uh, in the five years he was away. So,、um, you know, hopefully the bad reporting there by, by Sponichi,、um, we don't see any more of that because, my goodness, this past offseason, there were so many bogus reports、um, where at least, you know, people trying to jump the gun a little bit too early. But I am happy for Yokohama and Tsutsugo to get that reunion. Last thing before we start today. This video is sponsored by Tone Sport. If you are in need of a high quality yet affordable baseball or softball bag, check out Tone Sport. They have a variety of colors, including dark red, iron gray, radiant pink, and royal blue, as well as different sizes for adults and youth. I don't play baseball anymore myself, but I tried out a few of the bags and I can attest to their durability and comfort as they are spacious enough to fit all your various gear and items without being too big or too bulky. So, if you or someone you know is a baseball or softball player, definitely check out Tone Sports catalog.、Uh, and with discount code YAKUCOSMO10, you can get 10% off all their products on Amazon. That's discount code YAKUCOSMO10 for 10% off. Links will be in the description below. All right, now let's get into the good for the week, the good point, which is going to be Levon Moinello's move to the starting rotation for the Softbank Hawks. Because through three starts so far, things are going absolutely seamlessly for the Cuban Southpaw. And you know, Moinello's move from like, you know, high leverage reliever to starter. Is comparable to Kai Matira for the Cebu Lions last year, or even like Jordan Hicks for the San Francisco Giants, if you want to make an MLB comp. You know, it's a situation where the Hawks really need some top end pitching, 
They've been really hurting since Kodai Senga left. They don't have a true ace at the moment, despite the best efforts of guys like Kohei Arihara or Carter Stewart Jr. or Tomohisa Ozeki. So Moinello has to make the move based on team circumstances. It's not like he was begging for this opportunity like Tyra or Hicks, uh, who were dead set on wanting to move into the rotation. And, you know, when he pitched in Cuba over the winter, he didn't even seem to know what his role was going to be come the 2024 MPB season. But, you know, the Hawks' new manager, Hiroki Kokubo, said, hey, why don't you try your luck as a starter? You're talented enough. Uh, and in the couple of st- spring training games he got, he had a four-inning start and then a 5.1-inning start. Uh, and that seemed like it would probably be right in line with what he's capable of. I mean, you know, Moinello, a career reliever, never before has he started in his career. So it's a totally new routine for the guy, bigger, way bigger workload. And you think, okay, if he's giving you five innings every time out, that's, that's a win. But so far this season, Moinello is not just averaging five. He's not just averaging six. He's averaging over seven innings per start. He went eight innings in his first start ever um, against Oryx, gave up three hits, two earned runs, only four strikeouts. Leandro Cedeno got him for a two-run shot, uh, and he ended up taking the loss in that game, although it, it was actually a complete game. Then the next start against Rakuten, he throws six innings, allows zero hits, no runs, three walks, six strikeouts, so he exits that game with a no-hitter. Uh, then in his most recent start last week against Cebu, he goes eight innings on just three hits yet again, allows no runs, uh, one walk, seven strikeouts. So in total, that's three starts, 22 innings, two runs, uh, five walks, 17 strikeouts, and only six hits. So that gives him an ERA of 082 and a FIP of 271. Uh, and all these games have been on the road, by the way, so we haven't seen him pitch at home yet in the regular season, but... This is obviously a wonderful development for not just Moinello himself, but mostly for SoftBank, who, you know, always spend the big bucks and have championship aspirations, but it's tough when you don't have a true ace. Well, here comes Moinello looking to quickly establish himself as exactly that. And, you know, I I was pretty confident that this starter experiment for Moinello would work. Uh, When I made my top 50 video before the season, I still didn't know what Moinello's role would be, but I did rank him one spot above Rydal Martinez just because I I knew there was a chance that um, he would end up in the rotation. Um, And, you know, I I was on the record being much more bullish on this move than some other people because I I get it. He had no prior experience as a starter. He missed the second half of 2023 with elbow surgery. It wasn't going to be easy. It was going to be an uphill battle, and it's not going to be easy going forward from here. But my faith in him was mainly based on the fact that he's a four-pitch guy. You know, four legit out pitches in the fastball slider changeup and curve goes a long way. Uh, And as a reliever, he was very much a max effort type of guy. Rarely did he ever throw more than one inning in an outing. I believe his career high in MPB for innings in in, in a game was three. And that was, you know, way back in 2017 or so. Uh, And looking at his pitch mix last year... He was primarily fastball slider against lefties, 60% fastball, uh, 25% slider, 13% curveball, and then he barely used the changeup at all, only 3% against lefties. But against right-handers, he liked the changeup the most of of his entire off-speed selection. So it was 44% fastball, 25% changeup, and then he actually even used the curveball at a higher rate than the slider. So he kind of swaps the slider and the changeup depending on the handedness of, of the hitter. Um, so, you know, you can tell he's very meticulous, knows exactly how he wants to attack certain hitters. The changeup is arguably the best pitch in MPB, I think, had a 34% uh, swinging strike rate and a 100 batting average against last year. So it's right up there with, you know, Roki Sasaki's fork or even, you know, country mate Rydal, Mar- Rydal Martinez's fork for highest whiff rate in the league. Um, And then that slow curve he has is just a beautiful pitch as well. It's super aesthetically pleasing, in my opinion. So I like his arsenal a lot. And looking at his pitch mix so far in 2024, we're seeing a lot of the same, but also some key adjustments. So against lefties, he's now 48% fastball, 25% slider, 15% changeup, 12% curve. So remember, he used to be 85% fastball slider against lefties last year. But he's cut that down to about 75%, and he's become more comfortable incorporating that changeup. And then against righties, 
he's keeping that balanced mix. So it's fastball 41%, changeup 27%, and then the slider and curve both at 16%. So that part hasn't changed. Uh, he's he's never had extreme splits historically, uh, and he's not having trouble against you know anyone so far this year either. Um, so you know what what he has works, and it's just a matter of going out there and staying healthy for him. Because last year he only threw 27 and two thirds innings, uh, and he should already pass that up in his very next start. You know, plus his career high in innings isn't even like 60. So if they want him to get that get to that one 140 plus inning mark to have a qualified season he is on pace to do it at this point um, and he's been highly economical with his pitch counts which is you know what's allowed him to go so deep into these games he hasn't been running the pitch count up um, but you know they might have to step on the brakes a bit and give him some rest you know every now and then because um, you know giving him two to three times the workload he's used to right off the bat coming off an elbow surgery is a little dangerous but again, I, I like the adjustments we're seeing from him. He's not going max effort every pitch now, throwing 95-plus like he used to. And in fact, he's only averaging 92.6 on the fastball. So that's down 2 to 3 miles per hour, um, which is exactly the type of change we saw Kaima Tyra make last year, going from 96-97 as a reliever down to 93-94, uh, which allowed him to get 150 innings under his belt right away. So Moinello is pacing himself, obviously. He's he's saving some energy. Uh, and it has been eating into his swing and miss ability. Like his swing and strike rate right now is only at 11% in total. That's down 10%-ish from when he was a reliever. Uh, and then the called strike plus whiff rate is at 33%, which is very good, but not like 40% uh, that he was flashing when he was a one-and-done guy, right? So the overall K rate at the moment is 22.4%, which is nowhere near his career rate of 34.5%. His ground ball rate, though, is the same, very solid at 50%. And then the walk rate, uh, which really is important, is only 6.6%. Um, and, and that's great by his standards, especially because he used to be really erratic in the past. Uh, definitely a guy you would describe as effectively wild back in the day, uh, you know, walking over 10% of batters. But over these past two to three seasons, he's really kind of cleaned up the command. So I expect Monello to actually get more Ks as the year goes on. He can probably run that K rate up to, you know, 25% at least. Keep the walk rate around 7 to 8%. And then the workload, I doubt he keeps going so deep every time out uh, like this. But again, if, if he gives you 20 more starts of at least five innings, that's perfectly adequate. You take that every day of the week. So, yeah, good point for, for this episode has to be Levon Moinello. He's doing uh, awesome, and, and hopefully he stays healthy so we can keep seeing this all year long. And if so, we can safely say the Hawks have themselves a true ace. All right, moving on to the bad. The bad point for the week has to be that the Yomiuri Giants are benching Takumi Oshiro too much. Because when I'm recording this, Oshiro has been left off the Giants starting lineup for four straight games. He was used as a pinch hitter in the 12th inning on Sunday, and he hit a walk-off double, and then he came into the game uh, last night as a pinch hitter in the 6th inning, and then he ended up catching the rest of the way. So it's not like he's getting zero playing time, but I firmly believe Oshiro is the best two-way catcher in Japan right now. Elite defender, put up 20 defensive runs saved last year according to SIS Baseball, uh, rated very highly on Delta Graphs, framing metrics as well. He is a top five catcher at bare minimum defensively. I would say he's probably top three behind Seishiro Sakamoto and Yuda Yamamoto, but those guys don't have the volume of Oshiro. So for everyday catchers, you can absolutely say Oshiro is number one. And then as a hitter, he had a 128 weighted runs created plus last year, which ranked second among backstops and MPB, unless you want to count Ariel Martinez as a catcher, which would make him third. But either way, you add those things up, top three defensive catcher, top three offensive catcher, and you have yourself not only one of the best backstops, but one of the best position players in the league, period. And yes, he is a little bit of a late bloomer. Um, he, he's really only been at this elite level of production since 2022, but this guy has been a 750 OPS hitter basically his entire career. And, and remember, the offensive environment around him has been plummeting because of the dead balls. 
So while everyone else has seen their OPS dip from 750 to 650 on average, Oshiro has stayed steady um, through the dead ball era. And when you consider, again, he's playing a premium position, that makes Oshiro a legitimate star. Maybe not a superstar, but a bona fide star. Uh, and, and he's always been disrespected in terms of people complaining about his defense, in spite of the fact that, you know, he has a high caught ceiling percentage and the framing metrics all say he's excellent. Uh, he's always had this reputation of being an offense first catcher. And I thought, hey, you know, maybe he's starting to shed that a little bit after being selected for Samurai Japan. But that just doesn't seem to be the case. And also in terms of how often he's asked to lay down a bunt, like I always bring up the fact that he almost had a 2020 season last year between homers and bunts, which is just unreal. Imagine how many more doubles and homers he could have had uh, if he was able to swing the bat all those 20 times. Um, and, and with Shinosuke Abe, you know, probably the second best catcher in MPB history, only behind uh, Katsuya Nomura becoming the new Giants manager this past winter, I thought, you know, he'll, he'll recognize Oshiro's greatness and give him the role he deserves. But instead, he is going even further in the other direction. Like, he doesn't even seem to view him as the clerk as the clear-cut starter anymore. Um, and, and look, I understand he has some platoon problems. So if you have a really good backstop that can hit lefties, maybe every once in a while you, you can flip them. But you simply cannot make that case when you're starting Seiji Kobayashi over him. You just can't. This guy has a career OPS of 540. His OPS since 2020 is in the low 300s. He is quite literally like a pitcher. And you already have another pitcher in the lineup because there's no DH in the Central League. And so you're telling me that this team has a better chance to win starting Kobayashi over Oshiro. Like, really, you want the 35-year-old 150 hitter over the 130 WRC plus star. Like, come on, give me a break. And to be fair, it's not always Kobayashi starting over him because he has been putting uh, Yukinori Kishida back there as well. Uh, and Kishida actually does hit fairly well against lefties, and he's younger. So you can definitely give him some starts over Oshiro once a series or so. But benching him for this many games in a row is obviously a conscious decision by management. And they even said it. They said they want Oshiro to learn from Kobayashi and Kishida in terms of like game calling and managing a staff. And obviously, you can't quantify those things in numbers. So if they truly feel like he's lacking those sort of I guess leadership qualities, I at least understand where they're coming from, but this is a team with championship aspirations, and I don't know what more Oshiro can do at this point. He was a five-war player last year. And I, I, I look at the comments section just the other day uh, on, on a post on Twitter, and people were like, oh, this is the right move to bench Oshiro because Abe understands this game against Hanshin is going to be low-scoring. Uh, because they're facing an elite pitcher in Shoki Murakami, so he just wants to play a tight defensive game, like really astute move by Shinosuke Abe. And this sort of thing just kind of breaks my heart. It, it, it just, it really does, because the, the argument doesn't even make sense. Oshiro is a plus defender, and in an era where there are fewer and fewer hitters capable of, you know, even 15 to 20 homers and just producing at the plate in general, that arguably makes Oshiro even more valuable in a game where you're going up against a top pitcher. So honestly, at this point, I, I, I might actually succumb to like all those conspiracy theories saying Abe wants to sit Oshiro because he just wants to preserve the narrative that no franchise catcher can ever live up to him, which is true. Like Oshiro is not Abe, but if he constantly benches the guy that's been closest to him in performance since his retirement, that's kind of sus, I must say. And, you know, I am saying that tongue-in-cheek a little bit. Like, I think he probably genuinely has problems with parts of his game that he wants to fix. So hopefully Oshiro eventually appeases Abe and gets more playing time uh, as a starter. Um, you know, it's kind of like the Dusty Baker situation last year with Maldonado. And, uh, and man, like, I am going to lose my mind if, if they sit him any more than they already have. But... You know, done with that rant, let's move on to the ugly point. Uh, and remember, the ugly point isn't inherently a bad thing. It's something that's kind of nuanced or complicated. So my ugly point for the week is the new Roki Sasaki. And what I'm referring to is this 2024 version of Roki Sasaki, 
who is only sitting 95 to 96 miles per hour on the four seam fastball instead of 99 to 100, which is what we saw last year. And on the surface, that's like an immediate red flag, right? Like, what? He's down three to four miles per hour, and his max velo in, in a given start is barely what his average was before? That sounds pretty concerning, especially for a guy that's had trouble staying on the field uh, throughout the years, um, though it hasn't really been his arm yet. It was the, it was the oblique last year that kept him out for uh, two months, and he really hasn't been quite the same since then, at least in terms of velo. But there is a caveat to this, which is that both him and the team, at least publicly, are posturing that it, it's intentional. You know, they want a full, healthy, qualified season out of him, and to do that, they want him to take it down a notch, uh, which if that is definitively the case, that's fine. In fact, I would say that's good if Roki is only throwing at 70 to 80 percent of his ability. It probably does mitigate some injury risk, at least to the extent that that's even possible to you know, mitigate arm injuries at this point. Um, and, and he's still getting results with this approach, at least in terms of run prevention. Uh, and, and he's been running the pitch count up to career highs, 95 in the first start, then 111, which was a career high. And then 106. So that's all good, right? He's giving he's giving them volume. But the thing I find problematic with this is that in his most recent start in Tohoku, his fastball ranged from 92 to 99, and the average was only 95.3. And I, I haven't double double checked this, so don't quote me on this. But I've watched almost every Roki start uh, of his career, and I can pretty confidently say that is the worst average velo we've ever seen from him. Since, the, since his true rookie year, when he was still a teenager and he was super, super lanky back then, even more so than he is now. Uh, and he actually had six pitches under 93 miles per hour this game, which was more than his entire 2022 and 2023 seasons combined. Uh, and, I, and I don't think it was a radar gun mistake. So, you know, one possible theory for this big fluctuation where he did touch 99 in the game, and he showed in spring training once or twice that he still has 101 in the tank, uh, but he also has pitches that are well, well below what we're used to from him. I think he might be struggling to adjust to this new, like, slowed down version of himself, this new contained version of himself. I don't think this part is intentional because almost all pitchers nowadays want a much tighter velo distribution in their start. Like, if he was 94 to 96 the entire game, I would say that's good. He's comfortable. But if he's all over the place like this and his command has actually gotten worse, you know, that would signal to me that it's very difficult to just mechanically tell his body, slow it down. Because, you know, just imagine if you're like a sprint runner and you're the fastest guy on the team, but your coach tells you, hey, man, slow it down by 10% so you can save some energy for the, for the longer race coming up. And you might not know how to do that if you've only known that one gear, that 100% gear your entire life. So maybe sometimes he does try to take 10% off the pitch and he ends up taking 20% off. You know what I mean? So that's one theory. Another theory would just be that he's doing this fully intentionally. Uh, and, you know, there's a purpose for it to make speeds, which is possible. But again, if that's the case, why is his max velo even in high pressure spots with runners on base? Why is that not getting up to 100 anymore consistently? You have to wonder, like, is he feeling some level of discomfort? Uh, does he already have one eye on MLB and he's not feeling like giving total max effort to preserve his arm? Those are the questions I think it's fair to ask. Like, and obviously I'm not in a position to say, but we can speculate. Uh, and that's why this is an ugly point because there's just so many both good and bad ways you can look at this evolution or, or devolution, I guess. Uh, and even from just like a pure, a pure fan standpoint, as someone that enjoys watching players reach the pinnacle of the competition, uh, we know what Roki is capable of with, you know, the near back-to-back -back perfect games in 2022, the 100 plus velo, the WBC performance, the countless double-digit strikeout gems he's thrown in his young career already. Remember, he's only 22 years old. When he's at his best, I truly believe he is the most talented pitcher in the world already. He really has no flaws. Um, but if he's down to 95-96 and the command isn't as sharp, I mean, he still has that disgusting world-class split finger that gets a ton of whiff. And, and he's actually getting more consistent with the slider this season. He's using it more, which is a good sign. 
But this version of Roki Sasaki is is no longer in a tier of his own. Uh, I, I would still consider him to be the best pitcher in MPB for the time being. Like, you know, he hasn't lost that title. Um, but, like... Is he miles ahead of a Shunpei Tayamashita or a Kaima Taira or a Tatsuya Imai or a Shoki Murakami at this point in the season if he doesn't have the velo separating him? Not really. You know, I mean, Shunpei Tayamashita is literally averaging higher on the average velo this year now. Like, he's up to 96, 97, and Roki's 95, 96. So I am very eager to see Roki put together a full season. And if this is what it takes to get a full season out of him, then I'm here for it. Uh, hopefully we get to see some big, you know, playoff moments or so when, when he can really show us what he's got left in the tank. Um, but I'm not quite sure what to make of this development yet. So that's why it's in the ugly point. Let's just keep watching Roki every Sunday afternoon here uh, and see what happens. I'm rooting for him every time out. But that does it for this episode of This Week in Japanese Baseball. Thank you all for watching. Make sure to Follow me on X at Yaku Cosmo. Support me on Patreon at Baseball Cosmo. And like and subscribe on YouTube for more MPB content in English.